Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for bringing this great uh, event to Pittsburgh. We really appreciate it. And among the other uh, jobs I have, I also chair the Chamber of Commerce, and it's just really great to have this sort of exposure for the city, and it's great for business, it's great for downtown, so thank you. Um, so this is a fireside chat without the fire. Um, I, I am uh, absolutely privileged to have the, share the stage with Dr. Hebert. Uh, uh, Marshall uh, taught me so much back in the CMU days. We worked on a number of programs together, and there's really no better authority to talk about AI robotics, and I'll certainly also share some of my, um, some of my thoughts as well. Um, but Marshall, why don't we start uh, by setting the context a little bit here for us. Tell us how the study and, and application of AI and robotics has evolved over the ten, past 10 to 15 years, and maybe give us also a sense for um, its evolution and, and sort of the, you know, what, at what point of maturity are we in right now? Thank you, Brian. And I guess you're asking me that because obviously I've been in the field a little longer than 10, 15 years. A little longer. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, so the field has evolved uh, tremendously over the past, uh, the past decade or so. Uh, it has come from uh, being um, basic research, basic academic research, sometimes blue sky research, to a real uh, discipline. And with that had come uh, some serious obstacles. The first one is we need to define metrics, way to evaluate progress, and way to do this in a way that is systematic, that is reproducible, that can be shared across the community. Uh, that brings up another difficulty, which is has to do with data. I'm going to talk about data all the time. Uh, and in particular, the idea of sharing data so that we can actually evaluate our progress and we produce uh, experiments, we produce uh, results. Uh, we've made uh, headways in that uh, direction in certain fields, like computer vision, for example, it is still a very, very difficult process in other fields, like robotic manipulation, for example, where it's extremely difficult to have objective metrics uh, as in other disciplines. So that's one, that's one aspect. Um, another aspect of the evolution, which concerns you directly, uh, is uh, the way uh, academic research relates to uh, industry. And we've seen a complete transformation of this. It used to be that you, know, you would have academic research uh, on basic uh, ideas, and then once in a while some IP or some result uh, flow over the, uh, over the wall. Uh, what we've seen over the 10, 15 years is a remarkable fusion between academic research and industry activities. That is due, first of all, to this blurring between the fundamental research and the application, and this is due once again to this fundamental importance of data. And the idea that the, the link between that, that fundamental research and the application is that same data that has to be shared, which forces us to work much more uh, closely. Um, you know, I, I can take a random example, you know, a collaboration with a self-driving car company that we have, uh, which involves sharing uh, faculty, students, data, and technology in a way that would, we would never have thought possible uh, 10 years ago. So I mentioned this simply to say that I think we collectively underestimate the extent to which the uh, university research is being completely transformed. And it's going to look completely different 10 years from now than, than, it, was, uh, than it was before. So that's one, that's one other aspect. Um, one uh, uh, other aspect is the uh, uh, aspects of engineering science. What I mean by that is the following. Um, if we look at any engineered system around us, uh, we have trust in those systems because behind those systems there's something like 200 years of engineering science. We have formal methods, we have statistical methods, we have best practices for uh, verification, testing, and so forth. We have pretty much none of that when it comes to AI systems. We have to invent uh, all of that. So a large part of the university research is moving from the fundamental research on basic technology to that research on validating performance, characterizing, uh, characterizing uh, performance, and so forth. And the last uh, piece where new university research is evolving is in the general uh, area of uh, the impact of uh, AI and the impact of deploying uh, AI. This goes under various names, you know, responsible AI, uh, ethics and AI, things like this. Everybody has, and probably many people here, have statements or principles of responsible AI and AI and ethics. 
The real issue and the new development in university research is how to convert those principles into actual technical, implementable, actionable uh, uh, techniques. Uh, and uh, this is a rapidly expanding uh, area, which is not yet a, a really a discipline, uh, I think, uh, but will be uh, developed into uh, its own uh, discipline and its own uh, educational program. We, we are actually creating a new degree in uh, AI on ethics, for, for, for example. Uh, so those are just four things that I think are very different in university research than they were 10, 10 15 years ago. That's great. So since a lot of the focus of this conference is on manufacturing, um, how much emphasis and interest are you seeing put on industrial robotics in terms of the application of AI? And what do you think the impact of AI will be on industrial robots, robots both near and uh, long term? Yeah, let me uh, mention a couple of points about, uh, about this. Um, the, the first one, of course, has to do with the same thing, so I'm repeating myself, uh, about data. Right? Uh, and, and the idea of having techniques that are data-driven, including in industrial robotics, including uh, in applications that are very well-established application of industrial ro robotics that can be transformed by the utilization of data. From a research standpoint, one of the, uh, to me, one of the most exciting uh, area of research uh, is how to combine uh, traditional engineered models with data-driven models. And where should we put the cursor? And that depends, of course, on the application, that depends on the availability of data, and, and so forth. So I think that's, that's a, a direction that is uh, particularly uh, uh, interesting in taking best advantage of those uh, data-driven models and still keep all the body of work, the enormous body of work on uh, uh, industrial robotics uh, that exists. Um, a secondary point about this is that that data has to be acquired somehow, and it has to be acquired in a way that requires as little supervision as possible, as little human curation, expertise, and so forth. So there is uh, an important area of research here on how to do things with as little supervision as possible, uh, perhaps with simulation, uh, lots of work, uh, for example, uh, using data from digital twins and things like that. There, there is also... Um uh, sort of, uh, we call them cobots or whatever you want to call it, but there is a, also a place for um, the human being sort of augmented by and more productive yeah. by uh, sharing work with the robot. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. And this is another uh, very important, very important direction. In fact, I say often that a lot of the work that we do, in particular at, at CMU, uh, is not about the AI systems or the robotic systems. It's about the people. And the interaction. And the interaction. Uh, so, um, I mentioned one uh, particular line of work that's particularly relevant uh, is this idea of uh, understanding behavior, but more precisely understanding intent. Right. right? Uh, if, I, if I move my hand this direction, everybody uh, guesses that I'm going to grab this uh, bottle of water. How can we computationally model uh, this? Uh, I mentioned, for example, the work of uh, Professor Cheng Liu Liu uh, at the Robotics Institute and the um, uh, uh, Manufacturing Future Institute uh, looking at close interaction with robot manipulator uh, in a way that is um, certifiable. Right. In other words, not just something that we think that's going to be safe, we, we think that's going to work properly with the, with the person, but we can prove things about the, 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 the safety and prove things about the behavior of the interaction which of course is very difficult and involves some, some um, deep mathematical uh, models of the, of the interaction. So, so yes, that's a, critical, that's a critical piece of that. And I'll bring up one more just from my short time at doing some manipulator stuff when I was at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, there was sort of a shift happening um, even just, even as far as eight, nine years ago where uh, many people think of industrial robots as these very rigid things where you sort of teach it something and then it plays it back with incredible accuracy and precision and, and speed and quickness and so on. Um, but now taking that and making it smarter, so adding um, what we always refer to as dexterous manipulation. So the ability to sense and feel the world and be able to move uh, and sense objects much like the human hand can and then apply using intent, using those um, interfaces you were talking about, uh, uh, apply that to uh, to sort of real world problems, and in one of the problem sets that we always uh, talked about was uh, the assembly of small objects. You can imagine even just an iPhone. How do you take 
uh, two pieces to a case and put it together and not exert too much force, but enough that you know that you got the right seal. And sort of automating all of that is, uh, is actually uh, very difficult. Maybe you might share a little bit about, I know CMU has had many, many um, projects and research in the field of this so-called dexterous manipulation, but I think that's a big part of the future for industrial robots is commercializing that work. Right, uh, and, and again, one of the things that has transformed that, uh, that field, I'm sorry, I'm going to say the word again. This is great, go ahead. Data. Data. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, basically, uh, um, uh, finding ways of, of going the last, uh, the last half mile, basically, between what the um, uh, explicit models of manipulation can provide to the actual performance, mm -hmm. like almost human level performance of manipulation, let's say. Okay, uh, and that last bit has to be uh, achieved from learning from from data, and that's that's the, I think the interesting development is this this continuum and this this linking of the of the two pieces. Very good. All right, let's switch our attention. We'll take some questions after this one if you, anybody wants to. Um, uh, uh, put us on the spot here. Um, so with our universities playing such a pivotal role in preparing the workforce of the future, um, what should we be thinking about the role that humans should play um, in, in the automation of manufacturing and, and other sectors? And let's also talk a little bit about uh, sort of the jobs of the future and, and how the workforce will evolve to support um, the robotics and AI work that we just talked about. All right, so uh, if we look back many years ago, uh, this was the purview of um, highly skilled um, uh, workforce, um, uh, university education and so forth. Uh, we are moving toward a much broader definition of the uh, workforce and the workforce uh, pyramid. And we are, of course, part of that uh, development. I mentioned, for example, a program at CMU called the uh, Sales Program, which involves uh, dozens of community colleges uh, to um, 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 upskill uh, the workforce into the uh, AI and uh, AI and uh, uh, robotics uh, robotics um, uh, jobs. Uh, now, of course, we are very far from meeting the demand. In fact, we're not even starting. You're nowhere <laughs> close, Marshall. You got to you got to you got to graduate more people. We, we are nowhere <laughs> close to uh, to meet the demand. But that's the direction that we that we need to to do to develop basically this new uh, this new workforce. Now, I know the. Um, Speaking of the region here, there is a new uh, uh, economic development uh, grant. I know you've been uh, deeply involved in this, uh, um, uh, the objective of which uh, in large part has to do with workforce uh, development. I wonder if you have some, some comments on that as well. Yeah, 100%. So this uh, region was very lucky to recently have been awarded through the um, U.S. Economic Development Administration, or EDA. We were awarded $63 million federal grant. Um, uh, we were one of 21 applicants chosen from about 60 different finalists, and there's five regional projects that, uh, of which a huge focus will be workforce development. How do we integrate the broader communities and the whole uh, region in this uh, new sort of robotics ecosystem that's developing here in Pittsburgh? Um, I think one of the, just to share a perspective from our own business, one of the things that's interesting is when you first start out uh, uh, in robotics, you, you, there's, there's a lot of algorithm development and you're focused on solving the, the really hard problems and, and sort of creating that core intellectual property. But very quickly, you realize that there's a huge operational aspect that has to be created to get the data, uh, to um, assemble uh, all of the information and models that are necessary to uh, let some of the engineers do the, the, the really um, hard stuff that they do. And I, I think there's a number of job opportunities that get created in those operations fields uh, to get people an entry level uh, uh, view into, um, uh, into what we do, whether it be with data science or um, uh, testing uh, and field, field operations and things like that. There's so many different uh, mission, there's uh, mission control and sort of back end monitoring uh, applications. There's a lot of ways to get started in the field that doesn't necessarily require even a college degree or um, you know, a lot of people assume, well, you got to have a PhD in robotics to do anything in robotics. That's really not the case. And as uh, companies mature and, and start to scale out their products, they will have those needs. And I, I think that's a great way to incorporate the broader workforce in what's happening. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to open it up to the floor to take any sort of uh, questions that you all might have. Oh, there must be something. Who wants to break the ice? <laughs> all right, well, if there are... Oh, I don't know. I was all sorts of all sorts of questions, Simon. I, yeah, that's. Uh, I'm not going to put myself on the spot. Someone's got to ask something. <laughs> all 
All right. Well, with that, we uh, really thank you for your time today, and uh, uh, ho hopefully you learned a little something about the state of maturity in, in robotics. So thank you very much for your time.